Kubernetes is maturing, for example, moving from quarterly releases to three per year. It's adding many of the capabilities that early on were avoided by Kubernetes committers, but now are going more mainstream, for example, more robust security and better support for multi-cluster management and other functions. But core Kubernetes by itself doesn't get organizations where they need to go. That's why the ecosystem has stepped up to fill the gaps in application development. Developers, as we know, they don't care about infrastructure, but they do care about building new apps. They care about modernizing existing apps, leveraging data, scaling. They care about automation. Look, they want to be cloud native. And one of the companies leading the ecosystem charge and building out more robust capabilities is Red Hat. And ahead of KubeCon Spain, it's our pleasure to welcome in Stu Miniman, Director of Market Insights at Red Hat to preview the event. Stu, good to see you, how you been? I'm doing awesome, Dave. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah. So, yeah. what's going on in uh, Cube Land these days? Yes. Yeah, so, so it, it, it's funny, Dave. If you were to like kind of just listen out there in the marketplace, uh, the CNCF has a survey that's like 96% of companies, you know, running Kubernetes production. Everybody's doing it, um, and others will say, you know, oh no, Kubernetes. It, only a small group group of people are using it. You know, it, 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 it's it's already probably got newer technologies that's replacing it. Um, in the customers that I'm talking to, Dave, you know, first of all, yes, containers and Kubernetes, great growth, growth rate, good adoption overall. Um, I, I think we said more than a year or two ago, we've probably crossed that chasm. You know, the, the, the Jeffrey Moore, uh, it's no longer the, the early people just building all their own thing, taking all the open source, building this crazy stack that they need to, had to do a lot of work. We used to say, you know, chewing glass uh, to be able to, you know, make it work right or anything. But it's still not as easy as you would like. Almost no company that I talk to, if you're talking about big enterprises, has, you know, Kubernetes just enterprise wide and 100% of their applications uh, running on it. What is the tough challenge for people? And I mean, Dave, something you know, you and I have covered for many, many years. You know, that application portfolio that I have, most enterprises, hundreds, thousands of applications, modernizing that, having that truly be cloud native, that's a really long journey and we are still in the midst of that. So I still still think we are in that, you know, that if you look at the uh, cross in the chasm, that early majority chunk. So some of it is how do we mature things even better and how do we make things simpler? Uh, talk about things like automation, simplicity, security, need to make sure they're all there so that it can be diffused and rolled out more broadly. And then we also need to think about, you know, where are, we, we talk about, you know, the next million cloud customers, where does Kubernetes and containers uh, and, and all the cloud native pieces fit into that broader discussion? So, you know, Yes, there's some maturity there, and we, 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 we can you know, declare victory on certain things, but there's still a lot, a lot of work that everyone's doing, and that leads us into the show. I mean, you know, dozens of projects that are already graduated, many more along that process from sandbox through, um, a whole bunch of co-located events that are there, and it's, it's always a great community event, which Red Hat, of course, built on open source and community projects. So, you know, we're happy to have, you know, a, a good presence there as always. So you and I have talked about this in the past, how, you know, essentially containers are going to be embedded into a lot of different places, and sometimes it's hard to, to find, it's hard to track. But if you look at kind of the, you know, pre-DevOps world, skill sets like provisioning LUNs or configuring ports or troubleshooting, or, you know, squeezing more server utilization. I mean, those were really in high demand. Yeah. You know, if that's your skill set, then you're probably out of a job today. Uh, and so that's shifted toward things like Kubernetes, right? So you see in, you see in the ETR data, it's along with cloud and, and RPA or, or automation, um, it is right up there. I mean, it's it's top. The, you know, the big the big four, if you will, cloud automation, you know, RPA and containers. And so we know there's a lot of spending activity going on there. But sometimes, like I said, it's hard to track. I mean, if you got cloud growing at 35 percent a year, at least for the hyperscalers that we track you know, Kubernetes should be growing faster than that, should it not? Yeah, Dave, I, I would agree with you. When I look at, uh, you know, the big analyst firms that track this, uh, I believe they've only got, uh, you know, the container space at about a 25% growth rate. Slower than cloud. But I compare that with, uh, you know, Deepak Singh, who runs, sure. you know, at AWS, runs the, he has the, the open source office, he has all the containers and Kubernetes and has visibility and all of that. And he says, basically, containers are the default when somebody's deploying to AWS today. 
you know, yes, serverless has its place, but it has not replaced or is not pushing down or slowing down the growth of containers or Kubernetes. We've got a strong partnership, have lots of customers running on AWS. So um, I, I guess, you know, I look at the numbers and like you, I would say that I would expect that, that growth rate to be, you know, north of where just cloud in general is because the general adoption of containers and Kubernetes, we're still in the early phases of things. And I think a lot of the spending, Stu, is actually in, in labor resources within companies, you know, and that's hard to track. Um, let's talk about what we should expect at the show. Obviously, this whole notion of secure supply chain was a big deal, you know, last year in, in LA. What's hot? Yeah, so security, Dave, absolutely. Uh, you, you said for years it's a board level discussion. It's now something that really everyone in the organization uh, has to know about. The DevSecOps movement has seen a lot of growth. Uh, secure supply chain, we're just trying to make sure that when I use open source, there's lots of projects, there's the, the huge ecosystem and marketplaces that are out there. So I want to make sure that as I grab all of the pieces that I know where they got came from from the proper you know, signature certification to make sure that the full solution that I build, I understand it. And if there are vulnerabilities, I know if there's an issue, how I patch it. Uh, in the industry we talk about it's CVEs, so those vulnerabilities, those exploits that come out, uh, then everybody has to do a, a quick run around to understand, wait, hey, is my configuration, am I vulnerable? Do I have to patch things? So security, absolutely, uh, still a huge, huge thing. Uh, quick from a Red Hat standpoint, uh, people might have noticed we made an acquisition a year ago of Stack Rocks. That uh, product itself, uh, also now has a completely fully open source uh, project itself, also called StackRox. So the product is Red Hat Advanced Cluster Security for Kubernetes. There's an open source equivalent for that called StackRox now, open source community. Uh, you know, there's a, a monthly uh, a office hour live streaming uh, that a guy on my team actually does. Uh, and so th there'll be a lot of activity at the show uh, talking about uh, security. Um, so many other things happening at the, at the show, Dave. Um, another key area, you talked about the developers um, and what they want to worry about and what they don't. Uh, in the container space, uh, there's a project called Knative. So uh, Google helped create that, uh, and that's to help me really have a serverless operational model with still the containers and Kubernetes underneath that. So at the show, there will be the first Knative Con. And if you hadn't looked at Knative in a couple of years, one of the missing pieces that is now there is eventing. So if I look at functions and events, now that event capability is there. It's something I've talked to a lot of customers that were waiting for that to have it. it it's not quite the same as like a Lambda, but is now similar functionality that I can have with my containers and Kubernetes world. So you know, that's an area that's there and, and so many others. I mean, GitOps was super hot at the last show. It, it's something that we've seen, you know, really broad adoption since Argo CD went generally available last year uh, and lots of customers that are taking that to help them. That's both automation and security put together because I can allow, you know, GitHub to be my single source of truth for where I keep code, make sure I don't have uh, any uh, deviation from where the, 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 the kind of the golden image, if you will, it, it lives. So we are talking earlier about you know, how hard it is to track this stuff. So with the steep trajectory of growth and new customers coming on, there's got to be a lot of experimentation going on. That probably is being done. Somebody downloads you know, the open source code and starts playing with it. And then when they go to production, that, I would imagine, Stu, that's the point at which they, say, which they say, hey, we need to fill some of these gaps, and they reach out to a company like yours and say, all right, now we, we got to have certifications and trust. Yeah. Do you see that? So, so here's, here's the, the big shift that happened. If we were looking four or five years ago, absolutely, I'd grab the open source code, and some people might do that, but what cloud really enabled, Dave, is rather than just grabbing, you know, <laughs> going to the you know dot the, the github repo and pulling it down itself Do it i cloud. can go to the cloud yeah. so uh, microsoft aws and, and google all have their kubernetes offering and i click a button right. but that just gives me Kubernetes. So there's still a steep learning curve. And as you said, to build out that full stack, uh, that is what, what one of the big things that we do with OpenShift is we take dozens of projects, pull them in together so you get a full platform. So you can spend less time on 
you know, curating, integrating, and managing that platform and more time on the real value for your business, which is the application stack itself, the security and the like. Uh, and when we del del deliver OpenShift in the cloud, we have an SRE team that manages that for you. So one of the big challenges we have out there, there is a skill set gap. There are thousands of people getting certified on Kubernetes. There are, you know, I think I saw over 100,000 job openings in the, you know, with Kubernetes mentioned in it. We just can't train people up fast enough. And the question I would have as an enterprise company is if I'm going to the cloud, how much time do I want to build having SREs, having them focus on the infrastructure versus the things that are business specific? You know, what did Amazon promise, Dave? We're going to help you get rid of undifferentiated heavy lifting. Well, I just consume things as a service where I have an SRE team manage uh, that environment. That might make more sense so that I can spend more time focusing on my business activities. That, that's a big focus that we've had on Red Hat is uh, our offerings that we have with the cloud providers to do uh, you know, a native offering. Yeah, the managed service capability is key. Uh, we saw, we saw, go back to the Hadoop days, we saw that, you know, that's where Cloudera really struggled. They had to support every open source project and then the customers were, largely had to figure it out themselves. Whereas you look at what Databricks did with Spark, it was a managed service that was getting much greater adoption. So these complex areas, that's what you need. So people wince sometimes when I use the term super cloud, yeah. you know, we get in little debates on Twitter, which is, which is a lot of fun. But the idea is that you create this abstraction layer that, that spans your on-prem, your cloud, so you've got a hybrid, you want to go across clouds, what people call multi-cloud, but as you know, I've sort of been skeptical of multi-cloud as really multi-vendor, but so we're talking about a substantial experience that's identical across those clouds and then ultimately out to the edge. And, and we see a, a super PaaS layer emerging, right? And people building on top of that, hiding the underlying complexity. What are your thoughts on that? How does Kubernetes, in your view, fit in? Yeah, it, it, it's funny, Dave. If you look at you know, this container space at the beginning, uh, you know, Docker came out of a company called Dot Cloud. Mm -hmm. That was a PaaS company. And there's been so many times that that core functionality of how do I make my developers not have to worry about that underlying gunk? But Dave, while the, the storage people might not have to worry about the LUNs, somebody needs to understand how storage works, how networking works. If something breaks, how do I make sure I, I, can, I can take care of it? Sometimes that's a service that my, you know, the SRE team manages that away from me so that yes, there is uh, something I don't need to think about, but you know, these are technically you know, tough uh, configuration. So first to one of your, your, your main questions, you know, what do we see in customers with their hybrid and multi-cloud journey? So OpenShift, over 10 years old, you know, we started OpenShift before Kubernetes even was a thing. Um, lots of our customers run in what most people would consider hybrid. What does that mean? I have something in my data center, I have something in the cloud, OpenShift Health, thanks to Kubernetes, I can have consistency for the developers, the operators, the security team across those environments. Over the last few years, we've been doing a lot in the Kubernetes space as a whole, as the community, to get Kubernetes out to the edge. So, one of the nice things, you know, where do containers live, Dave? Anywhere Linux does. Is Linux going to be out of the edge? Absolutely. It can be a small footprint. Uh, we can do a lot with it. There were a lot of vendors that came out with, um, it wasn't quite Kubernetes. They would strip certain things out or make uh, a, a, a configuration uh, that was smaller. Uh, out at the edge, but a lot of times it was something that was just for a developer or something I could play with, and what it would break sometimes was that consistency out at the edge to what my other environments would, would like to have. And if I'm a company that needs consistency there, so take for example, if I have an, an AI workload where I need edge and I need something in the cloud or in my data center of consistency. So, you know, the easy use case that everybody thinks about is autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. You know, we work with a lot of the big, uh, you know, car manufacturers. I need to have, when my developer builds something, and often my training will be done, either in the data center or in the public cloud, but I need to be able to push that out to the vehicle itself and let it run. Uh, we've actually even got, Dave, we've got Kubernetes running up on the ISS. Um, and you want to make sure that, you know, we have a consistency. The between, ultimate edge. Yeah, so, the, the, <laughs> you know, I said, right, it's edge above and beyond the clouds even. Uh, we, we've gone uh, to, to beyond. Uh, so that is something that the industry as a whole has been working at. 
Uh, from a Red Hat standpoint, we can take OpenShift to a really small footprint. Last year we launched what's known as single node OpenShift. Uh, we have a project called MicroShift, which is also fully open source uh, that takes a, 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 it has less pieces of uh, the, the overall uh, environment to be able to fit onto smaller and smaller devices there. But we want to be able to manage all of them consistently because you talked about multi-cluster management. Well, what if I have thousands or tens of thousands of devices out of the edge? I don't necessarily have network. I don't have people. Um, I need to be able to do things from an automated standpoint. And that's where containers and Kubernetes really can shine and where a lot of effort has been done uh, in general and something specifically. We're working on at Red Hat. We've had some great customers uh, in the telecommunications space talk about like the 5G rollout uh, with this and uh, industrial companies that are, you know, need to be able to push out at the edge uh, for these type of solutions. So you, so you just kind of answered my next question, but I want to double click on it, which was, you know, if I'm in the cloud, why do I need, you know, you? <laughs> so, and, and you touched on it because you've got primitives and APIs and AWS, Google, and Microsoft, they're different. If you're going to hide the underlying complexity of that, it takes a lot of R&D and work. Now extend that to, the, to a Tesla, right? You got to make it run there, different use case, uh, but that's kind of what you know, Linux and OpenShift are designed to do. So double click on that. Yeah, so it, it, right, if, if I look at you know, the, the discussion you've been having about super clouds is interesting because there are many companies that we work with that do live across multiple environments. So number one, if I'm a developer, if my company came to me and said, hey, you've got all your certifications and you've got years of experience running on Amazon, well, we need you to go run over on Google. Um, that developer might switch companies rather than switch clouds because they've got all of their knowledge and skill set and it's a steep learning curve. So there's a lot of companies that work on how can we give you tools and solutions that can live across those environments. So uh, I know you mentioned companies like Snowflake, MongoDB. Um, Companies like Red Hat, HashiCorp, GitLab also span all of those environments. There's a lot of work, Dave, to be different than, we're not just, I say, I don't love the term like, you know, we're cloud agnostic, which would mean, well, you can use any cloud. You can it run was, on any cloud. It, but it and was, that's, it, what I that's look not at, what we're talking what, about Look here. at the, 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 the legacy that Red Hat has is, Red Hat has decades of running in every customer's data center and you know, pick your x86 server of choice, and we would have deep relationships when Dell, HP, IBM, Lenovo, you, know, you name it, comes out with a new piece of hardware that was different. We would have to make sure that the Linux primitives work from a Red Hat standpoint. Interesting, Dave, we're now supporting OpenShift on Azure Stack Hub. And I talked to our head of product management, and I said, we've been running OpenShift in Azure for years. Isn't Azure Stack Hub, isn't that just Azure in your data center? He's like, yeah, but down at the operating system level, we had to change some flags and change some settings and things like that. So what do we know in IT? It's always the, yeah, at the high level, it looks the same, it, it acts the same, it feels the same. Seamless. It's seamless and everything. <laughs> when you get down to you know, the, the primitives level, sometimes we need to be able to do that. I'll tell you, Dave, there's things even when I look at a cloud, if I'm in US East one yeah. or US West one, there actually could be some differences in what services are there or how things react. And so therefore, we have a lot of deep work that goes into all of those environments. And it's not just Red Hat. You know, we have, we have a marketplace and an ecosystem. You want to make sure you've got API compatibility across all of those. So we are trying to help lift up this entire ecosystem and bring everybody along with it because you said it at the upfront, you know, Kubernetes alone won't do it. No one vendor gives you an entire, you know, everything that you need for your developer tool chain. There's a lot that goes into this and there, that's what, where we have, you know, deep commitment to partnerships. We build out and support lots of ecosystems. And this show itself is very much a community driven show. And, and therefore that's why, you know, Red Hat has a strong presence at it because that's the open source community and everything that we build Yeah, on. you guys are knee deep in it. And you know, I wrote down when you were talking about Snowflake and Mongo, HashiCorp's another one. I wrote down, you know, Dell, HPE, Cisco, Lenovo, Pure, all that to me, that should be their strategy. NetApp, their strategy should be to basically build out that abstraction layer, the so-called super cloud. So it'd be interesting to see if they're going to be at this show 
it requires a lot of R&D, number one, number two, to your point. It requires an ecosystem. So you got all these guys, most of them now doing their own as a service. As a service is their own cloud. Their own cloud means you better have an ecosystem that's robust. Um, I, I want to ask you about, do you ever think about what's next beyond Kubernetes or do you feel like, hey, there's just so much headroom in Kubernetes and so many you know, active projects, we got a ways to go. Yeah, so the, the Kubernetes itself, Dave, should be able to fade into the background some. Um, in many ways, it does mirror what happened with Linux. So yeah. you know, Linux is just the foundation of everything we have. We would not have the public cloud providers if it wasn't for Linux. I mean, Google, of course, you wouldn't have without Linux. Not sure Amazon, you'd have the internet. Wait, wait, right, <laughs> you, you, you might not have a lot of it. So. Kubernetes, I think, really goes the same way. Is you know, it, it, it is the foundational layer of what so much of it is built on top of it, and it's not really. So many people think about that portability. Oh, Google's the one that created it, and they wanted to make sure that it was easy. If I want to go from the cloud provider that I had to use, you know, Kubernetes uh, on Google Cloud, and while that is a piece of it, that consistency is more important and what I can build on top of it. It is, it is really more of a distributed systems challenge that we are solving and that we've been working on in industry now for decades. So mm -hmm. that is what we help solve. And what's really nice, containers and Kubernetes, um, it, it's less of an abstraction. It's more of a new atomic unit of how we build things. So virtualization, you know, I don't know what's underneath, and we had to. We spent like a decade fixing the storage and networking components underneath, so that the LUNs matched right, and the network understood what was happening in the virtual machine. The atomic unit of a container, which is what Kubernetes manages, is you know an application or a piece of an application, and therefore that there is less of an abstraction, more of just a re-architecting of how we build things, um, and that is part of what is needed. And Boy, Dave, the ecosystem, oh my God. Yes, we've gone to only three releases a year, um, but I can tell you having, you know, our roadmaps are all public on the internet and we talk heavily about them. There is still so many things that just at the basic Kubernetes piece, uh, you know, new architectures, uh, ARM d devices are, are now in there. You know, we're, we're now supporting them. Uh, Kubernetes can support them uh, too. So, you know, there are so many hardware pieces that are coming, so many software devices, the edge we talked about it a bit. Um, so there's so much that's going on. Um, one of the areas that I, I, I love hearing about at the show, uh, we have a community event called OpenShift Commons, which one of the main things of OpenShift Commons is customers coming to talk about what they've been doing. And not, not, to, not about products, we're talking about the projects and their journey overall. Um, we've got at, at uh, the Valencia show, uh, Airbus, and uh, Telefonica are both going to be talking about what they're doing. You know, we, we've seen, Dave, every industry is going through their, their digital transformation journey, mm -hmm. and it's great to hear straight from them uh, what they are doing. Um, and one of the big pieces, an area we actually spend a bunch of time on, that application journey, uh, there's a group of open source projects uh, under what's known as Conveyor. That's Conveyor with a K, conveyor.io. It's modernization and migration. So how do I go from a VM to a container? How do I go from my data center to a cloud? How do I switch between services? Open source projects to help with that journey. And oh my gosh, Dave, I mean, you know in the cloud space, I mean, th that's what all the SIs and all the consultancies are throwing thousands of people at is to help us get along that curve of that modernization journey. Okay, so let's see, uh, May 16th, the week of May 16th is KubeCon in Valencia, Spain. The Cube's going to be there. There was a little bit of a kerfuffle on, on Twitter because, because the mask mandate was lifted in Spain and people had made plans thinking, okay, it's safe. I'm gonna, everybody's going to be wearing masks. Well, no, I mean, you're going to have to make your own decisions uh, on that front. I mean, you saw that. You follow Twitter quite closely, but uh, hey, this is the world we live in, right? So uh, I'll yeah, give you the yeah, last word. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if Twitter still exists by the time we get to that show with uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what, what, what happens. But yeah, no, Dave, uh, I'll, I'll be participating remotely. It is a hybrid event. So one of the things we'll be watching is, you know, how many people are there in person? LA was a pretty small show, core contributors, uh, brought it back to some of the early days that you know you, you covered heavily from the CUBE standpoint. Um, how will Valencia be? I know from Red Hat standpoint, we have people there. 
many of them from Europe, uh, both speaking. We talked about many of the co-located events uh, that are there. So a lot of pieces um, all participate remotely. So um, if you stop by Open Source, the OpenShift Commons event, I'll be part of the event just from a hybrid standpoint. And yeah, we've actually got the week before, we've got Red Hat Summit. So it's nice to actually to have back-to-back -back weeks. Uh, we'd had that a whole bunch of times before. I remember back-to-back -back weeks in Boston one year mm. where we had uh, both of those uh, events and everything. So yeah, uh, nice definitely tissue. Yep. keeps us busy um, with there. Um, you've got a whole bunch of travel going on. Uh, I'm not doing too much travel just yet, Dave, but it's good to see you and uh, it's, it's great to be connected with the community. Yeah, so the Cube will be there. John Furrier's hosting with Keith Townsend. So if you're in Valencia, definitely stop by. Stu, thanks so much for coming into the Cube oh. studios in, uh, in Marlboro. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. All right, and thank you for watching. We'll see you the week of May 16th in Valencia, Spain.